Namaste, everybody. And the first question that I would like to ask all of you today here, uh, maybe a question for all of you to reflect upon, does wisdom come by age? And when I ask this question to my own self, I start pondering into what age are we looking at? Biological age, chronological age, psychological age, emotional age, spiritual age. I think for me, wisdom comes with awareness. And the moment the awareness sweeps in, life transforms. I have divided my story into seven parts, seven episodes. The first episode is about happy childhood. When we remember or recall the memories, hey, when I was a child, I was so amazing. What an amazing childhood experiences I have. I recall, or many of them recall that, wow, well, when you were a child, you were so notorious and you were so cranky. But for me, it was a bit different. When I was a child, we come from a middle class family. Both my parents were working. One was working for 15 hours and the other one was working for 10 hours. So I constantly felt rejected, abandoned, nobody there for me. When I used to go to school, I used to see a lot of my friends getting their mothers either to pick them or drop them. But the message that I got was everything do it yourself. I don't blame my parents today. Because of them, I'm here today. What I reflect on, that they had to get the food on the table to send us to the best schools that they could manage. So when the theme comes in, believe in yourself, is not a cognitive or a some sort of spoon feeding, a silver spoon somebody feeds to you and says, believe in yourself, beta. It is an experience that you tend to take it with your life journey. And that helps me to understand that all this journey of mine has always been being yourself. It's like this movie, The Castaway. When you're put on a plane or on a beach all by yourself, the best choice you have is to do it yourself. Believe in yourself and start walking. And then my movie or my story moved to the episode two. And the episode two is all about comparison. Let me tell you a story about vacation. You know the school days, your final exams, you're all waiting to get your luggage and go to your relatives. We're all having so much of fun, mango time, so much of good times are gonna start. For me, it was a little different. I was dropped to my relatives. I was dropped at my relatives place and I was given some gyan. The one of the thing that I was told that be a good boy, don't complain, don't ask, don't go and check that you know that you need something more. And that good boy syndrome was so much within me that I ended up just gulping, swallowing all the experiences of comparison, which was done by my relatives, knowingly or unknowingly. Comparison about you're not good enough, comparison about you don't look good, comparison about you can, you know, your marks are lesser than my child. And I felt the good boy has to believe all of that and accept it and keep everything under the carpet because I can't complain. I don't have the permission to complain. And I started believing that this is how life is supposed to be. I'm not good enough. I, whatever I do, I will end up with smoke. Nobody wants to hear me. And that started a journey of feeling being compared and constantly evoking the thought of, I'm not okay, everyone is okay. And that moved to the episode three of my life. And that was being notorious, cranky, and a brat and a rebel. And this story goes a little different. You know, when I went for, uh, when I heard about, this, when we hear about the school reunions, we talk about, hey, you were the brat one, you know, you were, you were really uh, the one who was, you know, getting on the teacher's nerve. And those feedback or those things we laugh at, but I don't. Because for me, there is no space for emotion articulation. How do I articulate what I feel? Because mental health was far, far, far behind. That mental health was not spoken. It was limited, it had a limited access to many of my family and my community in my age. So it was always that when you have a physical scar, you go to a doctor, you know, get some, pop some pills, and next morning you should be okay. But when you're going through mental scar, which are there for years in your life, 
it's not talked about. A message that I got from my family, when you don't know what is happening to you, don't worry, beta. Just close your eyes, sleep. And next morning, forget it, it was there. Just check, did that happen any time with you? And I locked that part of my unhealed self behind the doors of my mental mind, and I never paid attention. I ignore that it exists. I ignore that it has this, any relevance in my present state. And that also led me to feel that I'm not good enough. But then there was a voice in my gut. And the voice in my gut was, don't worry, this shall pass. Don't worry about life. These things are going to be better. But then the external voice or external chatter was so strong, so profound, that I started ignoring what was happening here, what was the message that I was given here, and I started believing, no, this is how life is. And then in my school, uh, when you are a brat, you are never loved by your teachers because they want to take you out of the class. They want to throw you because, you naughty boy, go there, go outside. And I was like, okay, that's an easy way to get attention from my teachers rather than getting no attention for my existence. So that route, was a route where I felt that I'm getting more attention. And then the bias is built up. My teacher never thought that why is Paris behaving like this? Rather than understanding the intention behind my behavior, they started judging my behavior and started penalizing me for my behavior. It was felt good because it was acknowledged. I felt this was better than feel rejected. And that way, I started, I was between the age of 11 to 15, I remember that. The puberty stage, you are all in the hormonal imbalances or changes in your life, and you are ranting, you're angry. Yet you don't know who is there to support you. I was depressed for, deep depression for five years, articulating it into a form of an emotion called anger, rebel. And then I started voicing out in different competitions like elocution, debates. And what happens when you're in your school, when you know that, you know, in my school, I remember the first standard onwards, one girl who came first to the ninth standard, she was first. And I remember my number was always 23rd, 24th. So there was a perception built up about people. I don't blame anybody today. I say, this is how it was for me. But then, when I started voicing out in elocution, I was told by my teacher, I was announced, first of all, that you came first in Hindi, Marathi, English, elocution. Then on the stage, I was told that, hey, it's you. You cannot be first in all three. Let me give you one thing. Let, me, let, let you come first in this, second year and third year. And I felt like a good boy, a good student. I should accept that because maybe I'm really not good enough. And that journey really kept a lot of traumatic experience in me. But life never stopped. I met, went to another episode of my life. And that episode was about taking charge. Now, taking charge at the age of 16, when I just got out of my 10th standard exam, and I went to my mom's uh, friend's place, and I asked her, you know, oh, maybe is there any job that I can do here? I really love to. It was a computer institute, and I remember, uh, you know, computer was in boom, and a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of people were registering for programming. And I was a young chap, and I just said, that I can do this. I can sell this product. So what did I do? I went and became a career counselor, not even in 18, okay, not even a graduate. And I, I did some road shows, I became like a clown computer. And I had all that feeling that, hey, I could do this beautifully. And believe you me, in three months before my results were out, I had superseded the six or nine months target just by three months of just being dedicated to what I'm doing in my life. And then, when I superseded, money start coming in, you get confidence with money, with your acknowledgement about your work, and I started rising very high. I used to work, I used to go to college. I'm not a person, I never had a dream that go to college, be a chocolate boy, get some, you know, go to canteen food together, and then go for movies. I had a dream that I want to do something in my life. I had a dream that I want to become something, and that inner calling was so strong that I never stop. But then, when you are really doing good, and you are in a team of people who are graduate, MBAs, and you know, you, they know it all, 
But you have passion, you have talent, but you don't have experience. I was caught with bullying. Bullying at workplace just before the age of 18, not knowing how to handle it. So much of trauma, so much of things just rush back, feeling again that, am I good enough? And this happens in corporates. Knowingly, unknowingly, you are criticized for something that you really don't know. And something that you know you're doing good, but you're put down. And life never stopped. I felt, OK, I have to move on. The message in my gut was so strong that life never stops. You have to do, you have to believe in yourself. Because remember, the, the, I was born and raised with the thought of, you have to do it by yourself. So what happened? The episode at the age of 24. That's an interesting one that happened in my life. That's called believe in yourself episode. In this episode, I, w I got a call from the fourth B school in India when I was at the age of 24. If you remember, it was SIBM, Symbiosis Institute of Business Management. Dr. Mudhudri called me and said, can you do some session for people? I said, are you t telling me? I mean, are you really? There are lions in the dance there. They're going to come and bounce at me. I really don't know whether I'll be able to do that. And then he said, no, I mean, like, we're pretty interested to work with you. And somewhere, my gut started voicing out loud and started telling me, Paris, I believe in you the more you believe in yourself. And that was a fourth B school. I got an opportunity to work with people. I was just a postgraduate, not from a very fancy MBA colleges. People were so elder to me. That I was, and, and I was like shaking every time in the session. But my gut told me that you are powerful. You are better than what you think about yourself. And my journey unfolded for me. Then I got engaged for almost three years with SIBM and then with many other families of symbiosis. Life was so beautiful, I was going, I was making my name. Then the episode comes, is the rise of Phoenix. This is an interesting one because at the age of 28, when you're doing really good as a professor come corporate trainings, and you've been doing coaching as well, and I, was, I, I thought that I want to become a life coach, because that's something that resonates with me a lot. And at the age of 28, I, took, I picked up a program, and I said that I want to learn this because there was no certifying body. I was doing life coaching for years, but there was no certifying body. So I signed up for the program. I completed the program. There was an assessment. During the time of my assessment, my coach tells me, oh, you're not coaching the way I taught you. You're not following the framework I taught you, so you're a waste. You're not a good coach. And you know when, what happens to a phoenix? when it is burned down to ashes, it grows. And that, at the age of 33, I was the world's youngest coaches achieving master certified coach, where people at the age of 50 and 55 get that. And I proudly believe, people say that, you know, Paris, we would like to introduce you to the youngest coach. I said, yes, and I earned it. It is all in the hard work. So 33 got the, the uh, I was awarded by ICF as a Young Leader Award in Pittsburgh. And then in EMCC, that's another body called European Mentoring Coaching Council, I was awarded as a Global Coach of the Year for my contribution in space of mental health. This did not stop here, the rise of Phoenix, because at the uh, last, uh, this year, in the month of June, I established a coaching institute. And the moment I did that, a lot of my competitors got a little upset. One of the institutes put me down by accusing me so badly, shaming me publicly. And I just said, it's okay. When I believe in myself, nothing's going to stop me. So being resilient, being consistent of what I'm doing every day, that helped me to grow. Today I'm very successful in the space of mental health and coaching that I offer to the world. And that comes to the last part, the last segment, which is very, very important to share, is contribution, the last episode. Like we are born, okay, and we die. But that's not what we are here for in this planet. We have a purpose, and the purpose keeps unfolding the moment you get in touch with your gut, with your inner self. And that took place in the year 2015. Me and my sister, Ita, uh, she's right here today. We went through our bouts of depression. We didn't know how to handle depression, how to handle mental work. And so we decided in 2015 to establish 
uh, a platform called Tavamitra. It's a Sanskrit word, it means your friend. You're never alone in your life. What we went through, we do not want the world to go through. I heard somebody talking about contribution. I believe contribution begins every moment when you think for the world, not for yourself. And we established this uh, a, a support platform, which is called Group Coaching for Less Fortunate. So less fortunate people could be from people who are maids, drivers, who are having anger issues, or violence at home. Many of these things we started talking to them and supporting them to see what is a better way to handle things. But then we were all surprised and shocked because we realized that it is not about for the less fortunate people only. It is for everyone in this globe. And how do we do that? How do we handle it? How do we reach out to millions and trillions of people across the globe so that they can take care of their mental health? So in 2020, we launched a video campaign. It's, it's a certification, free certification program on mental health. It's called My Mental Health, My Priority. And pandemic came in. We reached almost 7,000 participation across 50 countries in a span of six months, inspiring people on spreading of mental health awareness. And that itself is going to go on. Like a platform like TEDx, it helps me to say that it is also a healing platform. When I'm sharing my story to you, I'm actually healing that part of me which was ignored, which was abandoned, and which I felt is not good enough. And I started realizing it, that the more and more you go deep dive into yourself, you realize that, hey, you're worthy of everything. You're supposed to be scared of only fear of falling and fear of loud noise. These are the two fears we get naturally. But the rest of the fears in our life is coming from the external environment, the critical voice telling us what you should not do. But your gut keeps telling you because that's a natural part of you, which was there right in the time when you were in the womb of your mother. And it says, believe in yourself because life is going to be great. The first nine months are taken care. The next 90 years are taken care too. Why are you, why are you interfering by doubting that process? And when I look at my life graph today, when I'm sharing this story, I only see inspiration. I only see empowerment. So my motive of life Moving on from now, as I'm sharing, it has been there for a while, is inspire self, empower others, and transform generations through thinking, feeling, and actions. So what I want to conclude with all the people who are sitting out here and respectfully listening to this voice is the moment you change the map, the internal map of your life, the external critical map has no influence on you. This is Paris and this is my story. Namaste.